bright blessed day, the dark sing night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying how they do. They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They're like much more than I ever knew. And I think to myself, What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful world If you raise your hand, let's have a chance to welcome you. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and well, let's uh, let's start right here. Yeah, where are you guys from? You don't have to stand. From Gatlinburg. Well, great. Good to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. I don't know if I've ever heard of anyone from Gatlinburg. I know of everybody going to Gatlinburg, but really no kidding that's great well good to have you welcome saw some hands in the back there yes key largo awesome yes sir Asheville. good to have you welcome i did a wedding yesterday for a family and they were from Asheville, i believe so well good to good to see you here you're not part of that family are you all right all right Saw another hand somewhere back there. Where did the other hand go that I saw? Anybody? Where'd it go? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yay. Well, welcome. Good to have you. Welcome. Good to see you. Gary, what are you doing? Jim, I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, well, then you're safe. All right, all right. Uh, good to see Jim Roper back, by the way. He's, uh, this is his first day back. He's been down for the count for a week, and we're just glad he's here. Someone else, another, another hand. Yes? From Miami. From Miami, welcome. Good to have you. Awesome. Robert from Alabama, all right. What part of Alabama? Awesome. That's right, at, right there almost, on the other side of Lookout Mountain. All right, good. Well, good to have you. Do we get everybody? Anybody else? All right. In a minute, we're going to stand and greet one another. We're going to worship some, but I want you to watch a clip that just will set the tone. You know, we've been talking a lot about, about how God is... is transcendent over everything and then we've talked about how but he's not just transcendent overall but he's also a personal God and we've been talking a lot about our relationship with this this transcendent but yet personal God and I just want you to watch this as we as we think about our our Christmas season and get ready to uh, to lead into it so let's take a look at it
Uh oh. What do you think, Gary? We need to retry it? All right. All right, let's turn the lights back up. Well, Gary gets that going right. We'll, uh, we'll stand together. Let's look around, find somebody you don't know, introduce yourself. Let's greet one another this morning, and we'll do it later in the service. How's that? God is forever faithful. God has shown his love to us in coming to this earth. Let's celebrate him together this morning.
Amen. Amen. Father, in your word, we see that for so very long, people have been looking to you to be their faithful God, to be their strong God. They found you to be their strong tower, their, their strong refuge, their strong fortress, and their strong deliverer. And we just thank you today that we can come to you and say, thank you, God, that you give us strength for this life. Thank you that you have won the victory over our sin and shame and over death. And so we come and we say thank you. We praise you that you are stronger. God, help us to trust you today, to give you the glory, that we might give your light and your hope and your love to this world. In Jesus' name. see what happens here. We'll show that, and then we'll worship through, through giving here in just a minute. Let's run it.
I tease Gary a lot, but it's sure a good thing to have him back there to be able to get things like that running when they don't work right, so that's awesome. So. Well, let's pray and let's worship through, through giving right now. By the way, it's also good to have Trevor and Nikki back. Are you, uh, did you thaw out yet? Wow. Don't feel too sorry for them, though. They were in, in Banff, British Columbia, so they were, they were having a great time. It was beautiful, good shots, and awesome, good. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, and thank you for the privilege we have to worship. As we, as we pause, may we recognize the gift that you've given to us. And then as we say thank you to this time, may it be a time where we are just preparing our hearts and, and we're grateful for all that you've done. Thank you so much. We pray you'll bless the children as they go out today to Super Church and those that are working with them. Uh, Father, we're so grateful for the privilege we have to come together in your name as the body of Christ. We pray your blessing over this day and over the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah, the King has come. Beautiful Savior, God's own Son. Hallelujah, the Christ is so rejoice for our salvation's here. Emmanuel, our humble King, we give you our hearts as an offering. You laid down your crown and became as dust. offering. You laid down your crown and became as dust. Emmanuel, God with us.
pretty sure my heart would get bigger. That would change everything. That would change everything. That would change everything. Right? I'd like to think. I'd like to think. I'd like to think nothing would hold me back. Nothing would hold me back. I'd risk my time. I'd risk my money. I'd risk my friendships. My life. If I stay in the Bethlehem story. If I stay in the Bethlehem story. I think I get it. 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 We celebrate an event every year that struggle to grasp. To grasp its true meaning. Pretty good question, isn't it? If you really believe that, how would your life change? And most of us would say, well, we, we really do believe that, but I mean really believe that. And we're going to look at some people who got it and got that aspect in just a, just a few minutes. This morning, I want to talk to you about anticipation, rescue, and redemption. And have, you ever, have you ever joyfully anticipated something? Just think about something that you have really anticipated joyfully. I mean, uh, uh, when you're going on a, a, a trip, I, I know that Trevor and Nikki anticipated the trip that they were about to take. And, then, and the time leading up to it was, was almost as enjoyable as the, the, the going on the trip itself. When uh, Colleen and I are getting ready to go on a trip together, there's this anticipation that the trip is just going to be over-the-top awesome. You know, and you anticipate that, and that's wonderful. Um, or maybe there's an event, you know, and you anticipate the event that's about to occur. Um, even, it seems weird, but when you think about it, it's part of it. Even the lines at Disney, you know, when you're waiting in line, and, and you're, you know, gosh. Remember when they first opened, and you'd, you'd line up, and you'd look, and you'd think you're almost there, and then you'd realize you were just... You were only about five miles away, and it would twist and turn and go and weave and wind. But part of that was part of the anticipation. You get to, I mean, when you're on the line, going to Space Mountain, and the line is, is days long, and you think the ride is just going to be the most awesome ride in the world. It takes about, what, two minutes to do the whole ride? But isn't it a cool feeling, by the way, when you get there and, and you're next? in line. I mean, you could hardly stand still anymore. You know, the anticipation is just, is just over the top. Um, how about the anticipation of Christmas morning? You know, I thought what we must be doing to our little kids that are coming to church and they walk in the lobby and they see all those presents out there right now. And, you know, think about the anticipation of Christmas morning. How many of you, when you were growing up, would shake the presents? Or you pick them up or you hold them up to the light, you know, to see if, if, if you could see what was in there maybe. Um, I never did any of that, of course. But the anticipation of what was in that package was just almost more than you could stand. Um, it's just a huge part of the fun. And all through the Old Testament, we see anticipation of something great 
that's going to occur in the future. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, remember uh, we had the story in, in Genesis chapter 3 where you have Adam and Eve and, and the fall has occurred and there's a proclamation that Satan is going to bruise Jesus' heel, but Jesus is going to crush Satan's head. That's all the way back in the book of Genesis. And when Eve, in fact, when Eve, well, you've heard me say this before, she gives birth to her firstborn child, many believe that she is saying, I have begotten the man believing that she had given birth to the Savior. You know, she was fast forwarding through all these centuries. But the point is, she was anticipating that God was going to provide a redeemer and she was anticipating something in the future. That's what anticipation is. I want to show you just a few passages that will give you a hint of that. And then next week, I want to give you that sheet that I gave you. I've given you two or three times now where it deals with all of the Old Testament prophecies and then the, the fulfillment of those prophecies in the New Testament. I'll let you have that to hang on to again. Uh, just to review. It's a good time at Christmas to review why you believe what you believe. But let's just look at a few of them real quick. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Look what it says. It says that a virgin will conceive... And she's going to give birth to a son, and we're going to call him Emmanuel. And what was that name? What did that mean? God with us. And it says the same thing, over, by the way, over in the book of Psalms. In Micah 5, 2, it tells us where Jesus was going to be born. And this is, this is about as dynamic as saying that Jesus would be born in Tavernier. I mean, Bethlehem Ephratah was just a little burg, just barely a blip on the radar. It was a sheep town. Interestingly enough, legend had it, tradition has it, that the best flocks, the best lambs for sacrifice came from the flocks of Bethlehem. And interesting that God would choose Bethlehem Ephrata as a place to take on human form. Isaiah 53, 6 is, is such an incredible passage. It deals, look at what it says. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, talking about Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Now remember, this is all Old Testament, written before the time of Christ, long before the time of Christ. And then Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He left heaven, took on human form, and was numbered among us. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you know how desperately we need intercession before we know Christ? And Christ came to be our intercessor, to be, to be our redeemer. Now, that's all in the Old Testament. These passages are written thousands of years, hundreds of years before the time of Christ, and yet they clearly demonstrate that this one that's coming will be the Messiah. I want you to look at what happened in the New Testament very quickly. Look at Luke 1. Um, we find that the nation of Israel has been waiting. They've been waiting a very long time. For centuries, they've been waiting. Most of the time that they've been waiting, they've been living in oppression, either from various government groups or being led into slavery or oppression from their own sin. But oppression would describe the life that the children of Israel have been living. It's, it's the kind of life that we live before we recognize Christ, and we don't even realize that we're living a life of oppression. But they live this life of oppression. In the first couple of chapters in the book of Luke, um, which is datelined around seven to 6 B.C., um, it's about 400 years since the people have heard a word from God. Think about that now. There's a time in history where God is just silent. There's no communication. There's no word about the promised Messiah. And during this time, it would have been very easy to give up hope, wouldn't it? Have you ever just felt like the silence of God sometimes just robs you of your hope today? That was happening then. 
And in these two chapters, we're introduced to some very amazing people. Five of them that I want to mention right now. There's Zachariah, there's Elizabeth, Mary, Simeon, and Anna. All incredible people, people who lived, and the reason I'm highlighting them is they are people who lived with a sense of anticipation. The anticipation that the Messiah is really going to come. He is coming. God is moving just like he said he would. Remember the story of Zechariah? Like, like Abraham and Sarah, they're very old. And um, Gabriel, the angel, comes and says to Zechariah, by the way, you're going to be a dad. What? I'm an old man. There's no way we're going to have a child. I love the way the scripture doesn't actually say it with this sting to it. But it's like Gabriel kind of cops an attitude there. He goes, wait a minute. I stand in the presence of God. What do you mean challenging what I'm telling you? So wait. I stand in the presence of God. How dare you challenge what I'm about to say to you? And so he says, you're going to have a child. And by the way, since you don't believe it, for nine months, you're not going to say a word. So Zechariah can't talk. So he goes home. They ask him, what are you going to name this baby? And he goes, we're going to call him John. They go, John, there's nobody in your family named John. But that was the way it was going to be. And uh, now when Elizabeth, and by the way, remember what the angel Gabriel said about John? He's going to do great things because he's going to be introducing the kingdom of God. And there was some anticipation and some excitement between Zechariah and Elizabeth. And then when she's in her trimester, in her pregnancy, a relative of hers, a teenage girl, uh, comes over in Nazareth, comes to, to meet with her. Long trip. Takes some effort to get there. And Gabriel has visited this young girl as well. And uh, he says to this young girl, Mary, you're highly favored. Remember that? It doesn't say that she's blessed above women and she's going to be the one that we should worship. It just says, you're highly favored. Yeah, I'd say so, because she's going to be carrying the Savior of the world. And look at what it says um, in the rest of that chapter. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 29 through 38, it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua. You know what the word Yeshua means? He saves from her sin. You, you'll give him the birth. you give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? You know, people are going to talk. And notice what he says. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she was said to be barren in her sixth month. For, and get this next part, for nothing is impossible with God. I want you to just hang on to that phrase for a minute. For nothing is impossible with God. He's, another translation says, for no word from God will ever fail. Do you believe that? For no word from God will ever fail. And notice what Mary says. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. So then the angel left her. I want to live in that kind of attitude, don't you? Just, just to be able to say, God, whatever you want to do with me, whatever you want me to be, 
I really believe that you know me better than I know myself, and you know what's best for me, and I want to be used by you, God. I really don't fully grasp it all, just as she said. I don't get it all, but I know this one thing. I know that I trust you, and I eagerly anticipate what you're going to do with my life. That's what I want, God. And Mary was filled with this anticipation and excitement, and she hurries down to Elizabeth. And she gets to Elizabeth, and, and uh, I think there's some humor here. They get together, and remember what, what happened? What was one of the first things you read about when Mary visits Elizabeth? What did, what did John do? Yeah, John's in the womb, and he's jumping up, doing jumping jacks in Elizabeth, and, and she says, even the baby, she didn't write quite this way, but even the baby's anticipating what's going on, that great things are going to happen. And now imagine, here's the humor I see in it. Zachariah is standing over, remember, he can't say a word. So Zachariah's all excited. Can you see this guy who can't speak jumping around and just carrying on and trying to get everybody's attention? Because this is an exciting moment. And so... We have all of this anticipation that John the Baptist is about to be born and that Jesus is going to be born and uh, that the world will never be the same. Then there's Simeon. If you look in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 26, um, this is a guy you don't hear a whole lot about in Scripture. Remember that um, he was a righteous and a devout man who lived in Jerusalem. The Scripture says he was a good man. Uh, he was waiting for what was known as a consolation of Israel the redemption of the deliverance of Israel. And it says the Holy Spirit was upon this man. Remember back in Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would go and come. Um, whereas in, in the New Testament, he permanently indwells believers. Um, it's been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that, that he's not going to die until he sees the promised Messiah. So he's moved by the Spirit of God. And he goes into the temple courts. And when he gets into the temple courts, the parents bring their children, or they bring Jesus in for a ceremonial um, custom of the law, a purification ceremony, and Simeon takes the baby in his arms and he begins to praise God. And look what Simeon says. He says, Sovereign Lord, you have promised. You now dismiss your servant in peace. He's saying, I can die now because I've seen what you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. Now, you know what's cool about this? Here's a Jewish priest who's been promised by God that he's going to see this. And not only does he see that, but he sees what's going to happen to the Gentiles as well. He says, this Messiah is not just coming for the nation of Israel. He's coming for all people. And now that I've seen it, you know, this is the moment I've anticipated all my life. I can go home and be happy now, was basically what he's saying. And do you live with that sense of hope? Honestly, do you live with that sense of hope? Do you ever get up and think, you know what? This might be the day that I make a difference. This day might be a game changer in terms of God doing great things. This might be the day that God really uses me to help someone. This might be the day that my old friend begins to believe. This might be the day where, where my child believes or where my parents believe. This might be the day when, when my, somebody you love stops drinking or stops whatever addictive sin has just gripped them all of their life. This might be the day. This might be the day when, when my dad finally hugs me. This might be the day when things are different. This might be the day when my heart finally feels free to love again. This might be the day when God shines through me like he's never shown before. Do you think that would change your life if you got up in the morning with that level of anticipation and expectation? God, this might be the day that things will really change. Now, I'm not talking here about unrealistic expectations. You know what I mean by that? There's some things in life that you're just not going to change. 
you have no control over. And many times we just need to move on with our life. I mean, listen, I can fret and sweat and worry about more hair growing on my head. It's just not going to happen. And you're not going to see me obsessing over that. You're also not going to see me putting a wig on over that. You just move on. You just move on. Um, I'm talking about living with a sense that I trust God in my life. You see, when you live with a sense of hope and anticipation, it moves your focus off of the situation and on to the one who promises to work in your life however and wherever and whenever he chooses. So get your eyes off the situation and on to the Lord. He may not do it the way you expect it to be done. He may not do it exactly how you would want it to be done. But according to Romans 8, 28, what does it say? He works all things for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Don't ever think that's a blanket promise to believers and non-believers alike. He says to those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. And that's the anticipation that we have to live this life with. Mary had said, I don't get it, but I'm your servant. Whatever God wants me to do, I'm willing to do. And now Simeon addresses Mary. He says, it's not going to be exactly like you thought it was going to be. Um, I need to give you just a little touch of realism here, Mary. Because, you see, you've got this happy ever after storyline going with this baby that's going to be born and about him being king of Israel. And look what it says in Scripture. It says, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul. Basically saying, your son's going to die. Your heart's going to be broken over that. But he's going to be the one who will pay for the sins of mankind. You see, what should stand out with each of these people is that they held on to the Word of God and how they trusted what God said. Looking backwards, they believed all of these Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. They waited with anticipation for Him to come through. They knew that nothing was impossible with God. They knew that he would never, ever break his promise. And they knew that no word from God ever fails. They knew that no word from God ever fails. Do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that like we saw in that clip? Do you really get it? That his promises are true. You see, the Messiah have been promised for thousands of years. All kinds of prophecies. You'll see next week when I give you some of them, and this is just, just a sampling of them. All kinds of prophecies about the Savior coming through in the Old Testament. And the difference between these people and most of the people that lived during that time, just like today, the difference between these people that we've talked about is that they really believed it. They held on to the prophecies when everybody else was bailing on the prophecies. He said, 400 years has gone by. They're going... God is silent. He must have changed the plan. He must have changed his mind. Not these people. They said, we know that the Word of God is true, and we're going to cling to that. We believe it, and we're going to hold true to it. They held on to the promises. They held on to the Word of God. So how about you? Do you live with that realization that it may not work out the way you think it will, but that God has a much better view from the top than we do? You move through life saying, you know, I know God has my best interest in mind. You try to avoid sin. You try to live your life without doing stupid things and saying, okay, God, I'm trusting you to guard my steps. That's what it means to wait on the Lord, by the way, when Scripture talks about that. That's what it means to live with a sense of anticipation every day. Listen to what the Word of God says about waiting 
with a sense of anticipation. Let's read this one together, can we? Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I put my hope. I can't think of a better place to put your hope, by the way. You put your hope in a person, what's going to happen? You're going to be disappointed. In your word, in your promises, I put my hope. Let's look at one more. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. It says, I wait patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. You think you're just too far gone and things are too bad? Look at what this promise is about. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song on my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. That's the hope of God. See, unlike the people of the Old Testament and unlike the people in, in Luke 1 and 2, we're not waiting for the promised one to come, for the Messiah. He's already come and He's brought life eternal life for those who will believe according to Scripture. But see, now we live with a sense of, sense of anticipation that He's coming back. You understand that? What's the promise we're looking forward to? That He did come and that He's coming again. We live with a sense of anticipation that a, that a new day, when all things are going to be put right again, will come. When paradise lost will become paradise restored. It's been broken since the garden. And God promises that one day it's going to be restored. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, it says, the created world itself can't hardly wait for what's coming next. It says that all of creation is living with a sense of anticipation that can hardly wait. Look at what it says in, in Romans 8. Uh, we'll look at verses 22 through 25 together. It says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. It's, oh, this is just painfully agonizing as we look at our world and we, we think about creation groaning and the, the struggles of, of this world. You, you, begin to, you begin to get a grasp of that. Not only so, but we ourselves, we as individuals, who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship. The adoption to sonship. When you become a child of God, you are adopted into his family. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. The redemption of our bodies. That's talking about when he comes again and we get a new and a glorified body. Mike just got a new and glorified knee. But just think, you're going to get a whole new glorified body. The older I get, the more I look forward to a glorified body. May my luck, he'll make me 120. No. Yeah, I don't know what, you, we're not going to have an age. He just says it's going to happen. So we eagerly await that. There's anticipation that we wait for that. For in this hope, we were saved. That's a promise of our salvation. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Remember that. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. When you have little kids, how many times do you have to tell them to be patient for Christmas morning? Some of you have a husband or a wife that you have to say, be patient for Christmas morning. I want to finish this story this morning by several of you asked about the other part of the story that I started last week about meeting my dad, about my adoption. And I thought this is so appropriate as we go into Christmas to tell you the rest of the story. So, so I want to pick this up and finish this out and think about the hope, the anticipation that things are going to be right and may, things are going to be made better and the idea of being rescued and being redeemed. And you'll get why I'm telling you this story. Uh, show the next picture. This is a picture of 
of me and my mom as we're getting ready to take off to Galveston, Texas. Now, there was all sorts of anticipation that I'm really getting to spend time with my real mom. I was five years old when this picture is taken, and we're off to Galveston. We pile in the car. We're just going to be gone a few days. Then I get in the car, and there's my mom and another couple and a boyfriend who had already been drinking. But to me, see, that all seemed normal. And there's this anticipation that this is going to be a great time. So we go to Galveston, and I'm left with another boy named Junior to sort of fend for myself at five years old. We were in this house, and they were just in a constant drunk from day in and day out. And this is Junior. You can see the little guy in the back. That's my strapping physique in the front there. Um, this is down in Galveston, and I'm glad you can't see um, our backs and stuff because I don't know that this had happened yet, but this drunken boyfriend would every day would grab his son, Junior, by the arm. He would rip off. He had a big, wide cowboy belt with a buckle. He would rip it off, and he would flip it over so that the hook on the buckle was used, and he would grab Junior, and he would whip Junior, and Junior would be running around in a circle, and he would be whipping Junior, and this buckle would just be ripping and tearing. And then when he got through with Junior, he would grab me, and just for the sake, because I was there, he would just start wailing on me. And he didn't care whether he was hitting you on the legs or the back or the buttocks or the head. He just didn't care. It was just, wah, wah, wah. And, just, and I don't remember. I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, I don't remember ever crying. I remember this, this thought. You will not break me. Five years old. And one time, I'm, I've been whipped, and I'm standing off to the side as he's starting to wail on Junior again, and I'm staring at him. And he turned, and he says, what are you looking at? And I didn't answer him. I'm glad I didn't answer him because I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. I'm remembering your face, and when I'm grown, I will find you, and I will kill you. That's a pretty strong thought for a five-year-old, but that was the thought. So that went on day in and day out and day in and day out, and several weeks had passed. It was supposed to be a few days. Things are looking pretty dark. Junior and I were living in this little room that had bunk beds in it, staying there, and there was not enough room to sit upright in the bed that we were, that we were in. And we were up on the top bunk, and they had a, one of those plastic mats on the bed, you know, with a sheet over top of it. And I don't remember ever changing clothes. As far as I know, the clothes, well, obviously I didn't have a shirt on there, but had a white T-shirt and a white pair of shorts. That's exactly what I remember, those light shorts and a white T-shirt. And uh, I remember they brought a bowl, a big pan, a vegetable soup in, in the night with two spoons. It was scalding hot, and they just handed it up to us with the two spoons up on the bed. And we were hungry. We were starving, and so we're scrambling around to try to get to the soup. And as we were trying to get around, because you couldn't sit all the way up, one of us kicked the soup over in the bed and on ourselves. So we had scalding hot vegetable soup all over us. And before that would sink through or get into that mat, we're trying to eat as much soup as we can off of the sheet, you know, on the bed. And while we were in that process... I hear this on the door. It was actually softer than that, and I, I looked out. I could see the, the crack in the door, and I could, they always kept the door shut, and I could see the front door, but nobody answered. And knock a little louder, and finally, somebody came, and they opened the front door, and there was Grandma Hammond standing there, my grandma. She had gone to a friend and had borrowed the money, an uncle actually, had borrowed the money and had taken a Greyhound bus from Boggy Depot, Oklahoma, down to Galveston, Texas. An incredible journey for, for that period of time. And when I saw her, I scrambled down off of that bunk bed like a, like a little wet rat. I scrambled down. I'm covered in vegetable soup. It's just nasty. I'm, Burned, not badly burned, but I'm burned. 
And so I scramble and I see her and, you know, forget about what I got on me. I just wrap my arms around her. And I was just hanging on for dear life. And, uh, yeah, she's like, <laughs> she realizes I'm covered in vegetable soup and she's loving me, but she, as soon as she could do it, she backed me up a little bit and started to pull my shirt off. And as she pulled the shirt off, she saw all these marks, the bruises and the cuts and all the stuff where the guy had beat me. And I remember her looking over me. I was a little guy, so I remember her looking past me and looking at my mother. And she said, you will never touch this child again. And we walked out into the dark. I remember asking Grandma Hammond right before she passed away, I said, Mom, do you remember where we went that night? And she said, I guess we just got back on the bus and went home. I said, wow. I said, you must have been completely exhausted. She said, I was pretty tired. And so we went back, back to uh, Oklahoma, to the farm. I remember that probably the next day or next, within the next couple of days, we drove to the county seat, and there was an old judge who was bedridden. And I remember Mom and Dad going over by the bed and talking to this man, and he signed some papers. And he called me over to the bed. And he said, Son, do you understand what the word adoption means? I said, I think so. He said, you know that it means that they will be your parents. And he pointed to my grandparents. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that your mother could never come and take you again. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, then I don't remember these words. He said, you know that your mother can never harm you again. And I said, yes, sir. He said, is that what you want? I said, yes, sir. And he said, then you're Tony Hammond. You know? That's why adoption in the story of, of Christmas means so much to me. You know, you're... There's one who wants to abuse you and torture you and destroy you. And you have a God of the universe who, who did more than take a bus from Boggy Depot, Oklahoma. He came across the spans of heaven and came to this earth. And he took your beatings for you. He took your punishment for you. And he said, I'm adopting you as my son, as my daughter. That's the promise of Scripture. That's the Christmas story. Do you understand that? That it's not just about a little baby in a manger. It's about a God who loves you more than you can fathom. That's why I ask that question, do you really believe it? I mean, do you really believe it? Do you understand how life-changing that is? You know, I went through typical teen stuff, and by the time I got to be about 16 or 17 years old, I was doing stuff that I won't even describe to you in church because I'm not going to indict myself. But I remember my mom's birthday happened to be, my grandma Hammond happened to be on Halloween night. And Halloween was usually one of my worst nights. And I remember coming home several Halloweens and seeing Grandma Hammond sitting either at the counter or in, her, in the living room with her hands in her face crying because of me, because of my behavior. And I can remember, I think it was 16, maybe it was 17, but I can remember exactly when the switch went off and I thought, I am tired of breaking her heart. You know, she didn't have to change my diapers. She would raised her kids. She didn't have to feed me. She didn't have to love me. She didn't have to care for me. Let's face it, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of a right to life because I could have been on the other end of a coat hanger somewhere in a back alley. And so I'm real grateful that my grandparents chose to love me and care for me. 
But I said, I've got to stop this. And the motivation, I would say the main thing that turned my life around at that point was a love for my grandparents and saying, I'm sick of disappointing. It's a motivation that we need to have when we look at our God and say, my motivation for living my life correctly is because I recognize how much he loved me, not because he's some stickholder in heaven trying to knock me silly, but because he paid the redemptive price and became my parent and I want to live my life in a way that matters for him. Now, that's a pretty good Christmas story for each of us. In Psalm 3, verse 20, it says, But our citizenship is in heaven. My home, fortunately, wasn't in Galveston, Texas. I long for the day that I would be back and be rescued. We can long for the day, it says, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, talking about heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. In this life, that knock on the door, my Redeemer had appeared. But that wasn't my ultimate home. Heaven is my ultimate home, just as it can be yours. So I encourage us, let's agree and let's say with the psalmist in Psalm 5.3, it says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. That a great word. I wait expectantly, God, because I believe you are going to come through. Maybe not the way I think, but Lord, I wait expectantly on you. Let's pray together. And uh, then we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper. Our precious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you left the rights and the privileges and the beauty of heaven and you came to earth. You took on human form. You lived in our midst and yet you never sinned and then you took our stripes, our punishment, our beatings, our death on yourself. And you said you conquered death because of your sacrifice. And then you demonstrated that through your resurrection. You proved that you were who you claimed to be, God in human form. I pray right now that we will believe that to the level that our lives will forever be changed. That we will live with a sense of anticipation, a sense of expectation, that you are going to work in our lives and in our midst, and live with a sense that we know that your word is true and that your promises are true. that we will wake up every day and say, Lord, this could be the day. It could be the day that you come back. It could be the day that you give us to do great things for you. May we never squander that hope. And may we, like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna, may we look to you and long for that and trust you knowing your promises are true. And Father, for any that are here today or that are listening that have not received you, may they simply say, Lord, I, I desperately need you. I'm broken. I'm tired of the evil one abusing and using me. And today I just cry out to you, I need your salvation, I need you to redeem me. And I understand that you died for me, that you paid my penalty for me. And today, I receive that gift. I'm trusting you as my Savior.
this is the most important thing, Father, that we could ever do in this life. So may we not neglect this for a second. Right now, right where you're seated, we just say, yes, Lord, I trust you as my Savior. I believe you died for me. Father, I look throughout this room and I can see on faces and see in hearts a lot of hurt. So I pray that you will help those that are struggling recognize the reality of the truth of your promises. And may they know your presence and your protection more deeply than they've ever done before this day. Now, just a moment ago, when we were praying and you prayed to receive Christ, uh, I want you to just, everybody just keep your heads bowed for a second. But if you prayed that prayer along with me, say, yeah, I want to receive that. I haven't been sure, but today I want to be sure. Would you slide your hand up and hold it up just for a second? I want to, I'm not going to put you on a spotlight or call you out, but I just want to pray for you. I want to invite you to raise your hand. I'd like to remember you in prayer if you received that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and for your promises now. Bless each person that's here in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let me tell you what we're going to do now. We're, we're going to share together in the, in the Lord's Supper. Um, for those of you that have, don't have a church background, this is called communion. It's a time when believers come together and they remember what Christ has done for us. We take unleavened bread, which is what we have up here, which represents what Jesus did the night he was betrayed. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. Remember this until I come back. And then he took, after supper, he took the wine, which was, you know, he shifted from the, uh, the typical uh, Passover meal at that point to basically what they did in a wedding and it was like a wedding proposal, and he offered the juice like the groom would offer to his bride. And he says, remember, my blood is being spilt for you. My life is being given for you. And uh, so he asked us to do that as believers. And he says, do it as often as you eat this food and drink this drink. Remember me. So every month we do it here. As a reminder, if you, uh, he says, don't do this unless you're doing it in a worthy manner. In other words, he says, don't have sin in your life and then act like you're remembering Christ and participating with him. Don't do it. Just pass it on by. That's just sort of the one mandate that he has for us. And he says, if you're a believer, and by the way, he says, examine yourselves. You know, you can say, you know, I'm living like a dog. And you can bow your head and say, Lord, I am just broken and sorry for that. And in that instant, you can confess it to God. And he says, okay, I don't have to deal with it now. That's what Scripture says. Examine yourself so I don't have to. So... As we participate together today, um, we want to invite you. If, guys, if you're going to help distribute the elements, come on down. And uh, we will, if you need to slip away, certainly feel free to do so. Um, but I just want you to make sure, you know, some churches have a policy of uh, communion that is for their church members only. They call it closed communion. Well, I believe communion is closed. It's closed uh, if you're a non-believer. But if, if you're a believer, it is open to everyone who believes. And so that's the invitation that, uh, that we make.
The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I've asked John DeLong to lead us in prayer as we partake together today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're, we're coming on the celebration of your birth, and we are so grateful for that, Lord. But as we take this uh, communion today, it's, it's the symbol of the body that was broken and beaten for us. And we just thank you and praise you for that. And we just ask that you will uh, keep us close to you and help us to remember what you've done for us and that we can go out and reach others for you because of that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes so I've asked Caracio to lead us as we partake together thank you Papa, that you promised us a new life until we receive you as savior that you didn't leave us in our slime lord god that you brought us and i thank you that you made me sold out for you lord god and i pray that for everyone here and we'd be sold out for you and make you lord of our lives amen amen amen, amen. well scripture goes on and it says uh they sang a hymn and they went out so we're going to stand together and sing it it says actually there's another version of it, it says they sang a hymn and they went out and they went to the play called searching for the king which is at the Performance Center up here in Tavernier. So uh, if you haven't been there yet, I encourage you to go. It's at 2 o'clock today, and it's the last performance, right? Yes. George? George is in it. Brett, are you in this? I heard a rumor. Are you in that, Brett? I thought you were. All right. 2 o'clock. All right. All right. Good deal. Let's stand together. Let's sing, and uh, God bless you, and I'll be down front if you need to see me. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? This is his Christ the King, whom shepherds guard. By the way, if you have like about five minutes, and if you all want to help move these drums off the stage and maybe bring a few chairs up, five minutes you can be out. Uh, we're going to have about 90 children up here tomorrow, hopefully, and there's a big program December 20th for preschool and elementary. So if you can help with that, thanks so much. Goodbye. God bless you.
Let heaven 